Hi, uh, welcome to uh, The Pulse with CPL and Nicole Scheidel here speaking from Ottawa and I'm joined today with Teresa uh, Sullivan. Teresa is a stay-at-home mom now. She used to work professionally until she had, I guess, four children and so that uh, takes up most of your time. And today we're going to talk about uh, your journey with your last child, John, and I thought um, it would be interesting to the people that uh, watch us on Facebook to hear kind of what your experience was, both the good and the bad with the medical system. So you're a Canadian currently living in the US and though your experience was with the US healthcare, I think that there's similar uh, concerns and constraints and experiences in the Canadian healthcare system as well. So why don't you start by telling us a little bit about John and how it all started? Yes, yes, okay. So um, thank you for having me. Uh, I, yes, my name is Teresa, and we have um, now four children, and uh, the most tumultuous uh, one has definitely by far been John's um, arrival. We found out that we were expecting John in the fall of 2020, and um, it was after uh, we had had a miscarriage the year before, so we were already um, a little bit on edge. Uh, understandably. And there was some signs that there may be something unusual about the pregnancy early on in the first trimester, um, but with low progesterone and things like that. But we got that under control and we were hoping that that had been the um, sort of heart stopping uh, portion of the pregnancy now that we had gone, uh, gotten into the second trimester with a uh, heartbeat. So uh, we, I had um, health care lined up with a midwife. Um, I've had the last the, the last two children I had uh, with the help of midwives and um, I liked their care, but as we know, they're the they're the uh, boring births, if you want to call it that. Um, they uh, they use the medical profession to you know scan and make sure that everything's okay and still low risk so they can be the ones helping. So I uh, went to the 20 week, um, anatomy ultrasound at a regular ultrasound clinic. And uh, it was a kind of a chaotic, I think there was a, a trainee. <laughs> and so the reason why I say that is that it was a little bit chaotic and there was a lot of flurry. And um, as anyone who has had an ultrasound, especially with pregnancies, but really anything that's being diagnosed, it's better if the technicians um, think it's uh straightforward and all systems go. But in this case, they were kind of flurrying. There was a supervisor and um, they said, we just don't love the size of the baby. And um, we see there's a two vessel cord and these things indicate that um, that you would need a higher level ultrasound. This was kind of just a basic ultrasound that we were doing. So um, that combined with maybe my the size of my belly not growing like my midwife wanted, we made it uh, an appointment with a doctor for um i think it's called a level three ultrasound but basically what a neonatologist would read and so i had never met the doctor before um uh before i went in so i went into the hospital and it was just to check to make sure that that last ultrasound was just um a blip and that's kind of what i went in expecting with a little bit of nerves because of the previous miscarriage and so I, I'll, I'll just summarize it briefly, but uh, it was a really um, difficult appointment um, because that was the first time we were told uh, that there could be something wrong with the baby. But um, uh, the neonatologist came in to speak to me after the ultrasound technician had done her um, reading. Unfortunately, it was during COVID protocol, so my husband couldn't be there. He definitely would be normally because it was a follow-up that was a potential issue. So there I was in the uh, ultrasound room, um, still jelly on my belly, <laughs> all by myself, and um, a pretty uh, brisk uh male neonatologist kind of uh, runs in or walks in, introduces himself, sits down, starts clicking away. And during that ultrasound, this I knew he was okay and alive because um, the baby, I found out he was a boy in that ultrasound, but he had done a couple of flips and made it difficult for the ultrasound technician to see him properly for a little while. So I knew he was okay um, at that moment. 
but uh, he kind of, the neonatologist clicked around and um, he uh, said, okay, let's get your husband on the phone. And so I said, oh, okay, I'll, I'll get him on speaker. And that was kind of the protocol. And while he was waiting for me to do that, he, um, he just started by asking me, um, are you religious? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, we have a faith. And, and he said, I'm trying to figure out why you didn't do genetic tests with your age. And I was, um, I am 36, uh, but I guess I had hit the whatever geriatric, or I guess they called advanced maternal age. But he was wondering why I hadn't done blood tests. And um, uh, I was, that's never a good question when you're trying to just have a routine ultrasound. But um, I was immediately on the defensive. I'm also, again, reclined and with jelly on my belly with my husband not there. So um, it's sort of an aggressive question. And it sort of just went downhill from there. Uh, he, he, uh, said something about the size of the baby. And he said that um, I should have done genetic testing because there seems to be something wrong. There's There was a two vessel cord, which can be an indicator for a genetic condition, but sometimes isn't. Um, there are many babies who are born with just two vessel cords. Uh, we had looked that up beforehand, so we weren't too concerned. But he said that there was something wrong with the baby's size. But there's always a little bit of a I'm not sure. There's always a little bit of a timing um, uh, question in the age of a pregnancy um, because ultrasounds have certain measuring points. Um, and then it's a little bit of an art too. So you never know. Sometimes you're told that you're early or late for your, it's it's a window. It's not a specific. I, I just have a question there. So when you have had previous ultrasounds, did you ever have that kind of discussion with the physician about the results of the ultrasound? while you were like lying on your back with your jelly on your belly. So to yeah. say. I, it just, that's, I, it just, that's part of um, the uh, event that really sticks in my mind because I have a contrast with the neonatologist we ended up with and they, after their um, initial uh, scans, they had me get dressed, go to a room, a, a nice comfortable room, they had a piece of paper to draw a diagram because it wasn't all straightforward. So they wanted to be ready to explain. I was fully clothed. So no, I had, um, I had not, especially if it's a complicated finding, if it's just, a, you know, it, it, I think that the context really matters. And this is where that human um, experience really comes into play that uh, I wasn't even able to look him straight in the face. I was kind of on my back and he wasn't like he was scanning at the time. So you're right that there's definitely a, a human context to really consider. And I really noticed it um, done well in the future. So, okay. yes. So, so it, uh, he, he, when we look back, I can see that there wasn't a lot of facts. It indicated follow-up. Their baby was undersized for his age. There was a two vessel cord. Um, and so, but but not, not to merit what happened next, which is that I said, or he said, I'd like to do an amniocentesis and blood work today. And I said, well, what will that tell you? And he said, I need to get you enough information so you can terminate. And I was so startled. I'd heard it spoken of, but never happened to me before. And so I was, I was like, that is not an option. Um, can you tell me what's wrong? And he said, there could be something wrong. And I said, well, could you, with the information you get from the test that you want to do today, could you do anything to help the baby? And he said, no, I need to, I'm, I just want you to know so you can terminate. And so I said, so I'm not going to do an amnio specifically. I said, you can take blood if you'd like. Um, I'm, I'm not against information, but I'm not interested in a giant needle in my belly for no reason, but yours, yours is a bad reason. <laughs> and and uh, it was a very interesting moment because he seemed to get angry, um, which is uh, interesting bedside manner. And then he sort of flipped into an ultra interventionist mode um, almost immediately. Well, he, he said, well, you better come back next week um, for more scans and there'll be more scans every week. And then we'll have to admit you into a hospital and we'll give you steroids and we'll deliver the baby and it'll be six week uh, Nick you stay. <laughs> and that was really the next sentence that he said. And it was almost, um, it was so startling because if we talk about informed consent uh, or 
or any kind of information for a patient, uh, hitting them with all of those interventions with no reasons or understanding as to why that would be necessary, it just sounds overwhelming. I mean, I was there for a 20 week ultrasound to go about back to my life for another 20 weeks before I deliver this baby. So uh, he, we agreed to set up a follow-up appointment, um, but, and we, I had them, I agreed to a blood test, um, but after he hung up or after he said, that's it. And um, my husband hung up, then he, he actually um, asked me how, how I would pay for all of this <laughs> and who my um, OBGYN was. And of course I was with the midwife at the time, but I was ready to transfer into higher uh, uh, inter or, you know, a higher level of care if it was a high risk pregnancy. But he sort of just badgered that waiting after my husband had hung up to kind of belabor that how um, extensive this would be without any information as to what was wrong with the baby besides his size um, and my ancient age and uh, and the <laughs> that, that's going to make you feel really great when you're ancient at 36. Yeah. <laughs> it was so strange so so we left very shaken um, we were in tears uh, and and we it took us a few hours actually to sift through. Luckily, we have medical professionals who are family members. My mother-in-law is a nurse practitioner, and we have even some friends who work in labor and delivery in a NICU. So it took us a few hours to assess what we had been told, which was basically nothing except for there might be something wrong. We need to follow up with some tests. And so uh, we just it was traumatic. And there's one, one sentence he said to me was, well, if you don't, you know, you can come back next week and, but you know, maybe no heartbeat is what he said. And, um, I tell you that week or that those following weeks, uh, how many times did I think of that sentence? Um, of course, anyone who has a tenuous pregnancy, um, that's something you don't need to be told that we, we all know how fragile that can be. That part of life is, so um, in contrast, or yeah, yes, just, just on that, I just think anyone who's ever had a miscarriage like that, you know, that, I mean, at, at that point, after you've had one, you never take a healthy pregnancy for granted ever again. No. And I had that. I had had just one that year before. Um, and I had, I was on progesterone to support this pregnancy. We were very aware. Um, yeah, you're right. You never can take that for granted. You don't need, um, and that the way that sentence came out, you know, but it was all, it was all the format that, that flip um, really struck me because it instills when a medical professional um, has such a timeline that's so aggressive. Uh, we were really just filled with anxiety because I thought there was something I had to do. And if I didn't do something within a week, um, you know, my baby could die and it would be my fault for not intervening or something. Uh, and we really take the cue when you're frightened and a vulnerable like that, you really take the cue from the manner, um, and the half facts or all your facts you're getting from the medical professional. So, um, yeah, his annoyance with us in one sense, and then annoyance that he would have to intervene so much and we still had no understanding as to why. Um, but I can tell you the contrasting story. Sure, um, let's hear and, that story. Yeah. <laughs> it, it really is cartoonish how different they were. Um, so we reached out and this is where this is another big thing. Um, we are very lucky about our support network. I mentioned some medical professionals who were able to listen to what we were told with our uh, lack of medical knowledge and tell us that he shouldn't have said this. That is not protocol. This doesn't make any sense. You know, so that they helped us um, go through that. But we also have a beautiful community. And so we were put in touch with a pro-life um, doctor uh, at Columbia. And um, this, this doctor, she's just amazing. And they gave us her personal cell phone no number. And the day after that traumatic um, doctor's appointment, I was just shaking because I didn't know where else we would go. Um, I just figured that's where we would end up because it was the closest hospital. Uh, and so she answered her cell phone and she listened to what he had told us. And she uh, said, no, <laughs> she said, 
you're going to come to me. She said, well, how, how far are you from my hospital? And we figured we were about an hour. And she said, no, you will come to me and we will take care of you. Um, but she said, and she, she has the confidence of a physician that clearly has been working and, and is experienced. So she listened to, I was, you know, 22 weeks. Um, the baby was this measuring this size. And she said, I'm going to have my team do their measurements because I don't trust that guy. But also she said, this baby is, we cannot save this baby until he's this size and this age. You know, I think it was something like 28 weeks or, or 26 weeks they can, but he was so small, so um, undersized uh, that it, he would have also had to be a certain size. And she said, it's just because of the tubes. The tubes need to fit into their little airways and things. So she said, so I'm not going to set up appointments to poke you and prod you until we can do something to intervene. In the meantime, you just sit and rest and wait and pray. And so, uh, that's what we did for a number of weeks. And so, so just, I'm going to just stop you there. So how did that feel like, because it's not, you, you go to med medical professionals typically for them to intervene and do something for you. And yeah. now this medical professional is telling you, you just need to wait because we can't do anything until the baby gets to a certain size. So yeah, I'm all staring up thinking about it because, okay. um, we were in such a frenzy of doing and um, and anxiety and thinking that if we made the wrong decision, even about doctors, then something would uh, terrible would happen. Um, but she knew her limits and she respected them. And she said, she said, I'm very good. And I save very small babies. And this is about roughly how small I can save them. And so it was such a relief because she was the expert and she knew. And then she told us what to do, which is not to come in she said we could we could start testing all these things right now but that would not help your life and your peace so oh yes it was unbelievably reassuring and um, peaceful because then we knew our boundaries we respect that they can't do everything um and when they do it's uh beautiful so we finally got to meet her in person. She met us, even though she wasn't the ultrasound person, she's the uh, head of the department, but she met us as we came in. And so um, she put us in contact with a high-risk pregnancy um, OB uh, who was going to be following my case. And um, again, that's where they did the ultrasounds. And unlike jelly on your belly lying backwards, uh, they had us get changed, come to a nice room, make sure that uh, my husband could call in because there was still COVID protocols. Um, but they did a diagram and they said um, a few things. He is uh, he was extremely small. The two vessel cord could have something to do with it. But um, the blood test that that doctor had asked for came back and it came back with something called trisomy 16, um, which is very rare. Everyone was looking up... Uh, things in textbooks um, because they at first they thought we had misremembered the name or the number and it was trisomy 18, but no, it came back at the blood test uh, as trisomy 16. And um, that's when she said, I would like to do an amniocentesis to um, see, she said there's uh, unusual cases where it can only be in the placenta and not in the baby. But even if it's in the baby, there can be it can be compatible with life. She said she doesn't like to say incompatible with life. She calls them life limiting conditions, as in there could be um, a shorter life, but a no no less valuable life. And so she said it would help her to know um, if the baby has uh, trisomy 16 or mosaic trisomy 16 um, before he was born, but that since I had told her what happened at the last appointment and she said, I don't need to know that until we get much closer. So she said, why don't we wait until you're closer to 30 weeks, maybe 28 or 29 weeks, um, because I don't need the information until I need it. Uh, and I can't save him before 26 anyway. So another case where um, she knows the information she needs, she would like to have it in order to assist the patient who's the baby but uh, respecting that I did not want to, listen, I didn't want to poke around in there at an already tenuous pregnancy earlier than I had to, and they agreed. And so 
Um, we followed them, or they followed our the pregnancy closely. We were monitoring blood flow. Um, and then we finally did the amniocentesis around 28 weeks. Um, and the genetic counselors had about three or four extra people in the room because they were so interested in the, in the, uh, in the results um, because it yeah, would. That, that's not what you want though, right? Like, I told them you're, every, you're such an unusual case that we have to have everyone in here to listen to. I it. know, yes. I know. I just kept saying, that's why you use the word boring. I said, I just wish we could be a boring uh, scan. But we were like, they were nerding out really uh, because it was um, trisomy 16 res restricted to the placenta. I, It's it's amazing. Um, like miraculous. It, it's miraculous. Yeah. Um, so a baby with trisomy 16 uh, wouldn't survive first trimester, which makes me wonder, if, you know, what, if what happened in the first trimester with bleeding and low progesterone, um, if what happened there. But... Uh, but anyway, they are restricted to the placenta. That meant that the placenta was having a hard time. Um, that's why there was such uh, extreme restricted growth. But he was perfectly formed, um, perfectly uh, genetically normal, um, just really mini. And so she said, she's Italian, so she said, that's okay, we fatten him up on the outside. <laughs> And so, and so she, she wanted, uh, she asked that we could try, or she was hoping that we could carry him as far as possible. And we knew that the um, limiting factor for induction or potentially C-section, depending on what was going on, was um, his heart rate and the tolerance and the risk there. And so we were hoping we would get um, pretty far. Uh, but then out of the blue at 30 weeks, my water broke. And, um, and so she was hoping I would be able to try a natural birth. She said, it's better for the mother. It's better for the babies. But um, she said, we like the, you to squeeze the fluid out of their little lungs. <laughs> it was like, he's very little, but um, she was just really uh, pleasant to work with. But anyway, uh, we ended up rushing to the hospital, continuous monitoring um, for two days, getting steroids into me so we could develop the lungs as much as possible. And, uh, and then he wasn't tolerating anything, even the most minor contractions. So they ended up having to do an emergency C-section in the middle of the second night. Um, but he came out uh, perfect and feisty. And um, the nurses all loved him because he was 32 weeks when born, but he was kind of 28 weeks size. And so um, I can, can I show a picture? Yeah, Nicole? yes, please show the picture. All right, so this is, this is probably in the first, few weeks. He was like this perfect little baby. He only had, um, he didn't even have forced o or oxygen at any point. So his lungs were just, he's just miraculous that way. And he's, uh, he had a six week NIC NICU stay and that was mainly developing enough so he could eat because they're, they have, they, uh, you know, can't, can't ingest uh, or eat um, until they can. And so uh, he's had he had one of the most benign NICU stays. The um, one doctor said, and in fact, we actually healthed out of the palliative care um, program that we were originally um, introduced to this doctor uh, through. Because yeah, so actually, so tell me a little bit about why palliative care. Like, what brought you there? Or is that just yeah. what, what it is? So no, that's we were sent to her specifically because we believed this first doctor that said, you know, in, in a week, no heartbeat, maybe. And so we have had friends who have walked the very difficult path of um, some of the other trisomies um, where babies, they've carried them to term, but maybe not lived for very long. And um, we were sent to this uh, palliative care program. They're a neonatology palliative care program at Columbia. And their whole purpose is she's pulled together um, many disciplines um, to social workers and mental health professionals and medical professionals to walk with families um, wherever the journey may take them. So when we first came to Columbia, while they were doing scans to see, she said, my job is to save babies. And that's what she loves doing. But she walks, she thinks that every baby needs to be walked with. And so they do some special things. If there's, if it's looking like you won't get along with your child, they do things like extra ultrasounds and bring in grandparents and um, for those scans to get to know that baby as best they can for the short time that they have them. 
And their whole um, approach, so if I want to contrast them, um, the first doctor was either dismissive, you know, throw this one and out and try again um, for with a more straightforward case, like counseling termination with, with no uh, facts, but just that it seemed a bit complicated. Um, or the other extreme, badger the mother with all the interventions immediately. And it turns out that some of the things that he said would happen did happen. But the difference is, is that it was walked through step by step and it became obvious that that was the next step. Whereas when we first came, um, besides the ultrasound uh, with this palliative care team, we sat down with the head nurse and the social worker and they sat with us for an hour and they talked to us just about um, their their goal is to respond to wherever that baby is. They even were talking about, don't be scared of the size of born. We've been able to keep very tiny babies alive. Uh, they said they don't even rush to intubate or do anything like that. They just meet the patient if they're this big and they see what that baby can do and they respond to them and they walk with them as, as much as they can with all of their uh, abilities and respect where they cannot do anything and then make sure that families have full access and all the support they need to walk through that difficult path. So we thought that that would be, we thought that was our path and it wasn't. I have, um, uh, yeah, I'm almost one year old. Yeah, sure. Let me bring up a few pictures yes. of Sean and you can um, tell us, okay, what's this? This yes, is so a yes. lovely eyelash picture. He's yes. got perfect eyelashes, but also most importantly for it. So he was two pounds, five ounces when born. So obviously his cheeks didn't look like that. He was just so tiny, impossibly tiny, but somehow alive and um, feisty. The nurses said they could hear him screaming from the hallway, which doesn't make sense because he was too tiny. He, they just never expected him to be so strong. So there he is with his um, chunky cheeks, not gagging on a soother because he has a pretty at the beginning, you know, they can't, they can't do anything. Yeah. yeah. And then here's Christmas. Yep. Drooling like a baby should be. And uh, so happy. He had quite a, quite a bout with a bunch of um, RSV uh, one and two, and he has a little nebulizer he needs for his lungs, but they think they'll, he'll grow out of that in the next two years. So there he is made it to Christmas. His nebulizer is right behind him. Okay. <laughs> And then here he is sitting, working yep. on solid foods and um, extraordinarily normal. Uh, it's unbelievable how normal he was. But, you know, at that ultrasound, the very first ultrasound, he did two flips. And now here he's eating Cheerios and goopy food and has almost nothing, no problems. Uh, nothing that a normal kid couldn't have with uh, with a, a little bit of a small beginning, but uh, yes, it makes For a big sure. difference when you walk through it with them. Yeah. And so what would you, what would your advice be for um, families that are facing a challenging di prenatal diagnosis? Yeah. So I, I mean, we all think about second opinions always and um, the amount of stories that were told to me when I was struggling through this the first time, there was a lot of hopeful stories. People would message me and say, they told me my son, I don't know, X or Y. And then um, they send me a picture of him 20 years old and playing basketball or something. So second opinions and um, the support network and, and to reach out, it can be um, terrifying and uh, make you want to close in and just give up, especially if your doctor is planning on giving up so um, intensely that they would say, throw this baby out. Um, but there are doctors out there that, and I think that any, find a doctor who's willing to walk through the path wherever it may lead, because you'll need help if the baby's ill and you'll need help if they're not, but need a little extra help at the beginning. So uh, second opinions are key. Well, I think that is um, something to leave with is that having a second opinion and also walking the journey. The uh, life is a journey and sometimes the journey is longer or shorter, but to have physicians who will accompany you along the way and not abandon you makes a big difference. Yeah, and respect that mystery, uh, the mystery that is life because uh, he was not, you know, you never know where it's going to go until you follow through. So yeah, you're right, walk the path. 
Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Thank you very much, Nicole. Bye. Bye.